delighted to have a man of wisdom, experience, character, one we are proud of, one we, uh, we honor deeply to come and bring to us the minister of the word of God. So put your hands together for Mesha Gashago. Come and share with us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good morning. It is still morning. Thank you, James. Thank you, Lucy. We've, uh, as he has said, that's true. We've walked a long journey. And we are here today for the new wine. Thank you for your invitation, Dr. Lucy, and the ladies who have prepared this meeting. It's been a joy over the years to attend, to listen. The other day we were listening to one of the Dr. Lucy's teachings. I think it was at the Bora meeting or some past, uh, past meetings. We were listening with Jane. In fact, I was asking her today, what, what was that meeting? Because the teaching there was, was so candid, very powerful. So we also listen to one another. We don't just come here to, to preach. We also come to listen, to hear God. And some of the materials we carry from here, we listen. We listen. We listen because... We don't have one person who carries all of Christ. We only have a measure. We only have a share. When we are, we are made full by listening to other graces. So some of you, maybe you are coming here for the first time, and others have been following. Many of you can teach. Many of you can uh, uh, take this pulpit and share what God has put in your heart. But uh, we may not have, uh, all of us cannot have that chance. But whoever and whatsoever and uh, whichever way God wants to use to bring us to this point where we can be a blessing to you, where you can be a blessing to us, by just your attendance is already a blessing because we cannot preach to ourselves. So when you come and sit there and listen, compare notes uh, with an open heart, James has shared some very tough things uh, in terms of uh, the, the heart. And I believe, I believe there will be more of the turning of the heart and the adjustments of the heart in days to come. Uh, in fact, that word there, turning of heart, is the last statement that Malachi makes. Yeah. And he says, is, there is no turning of hearts the land will be visited with a curse. And after the turning of the heart, what follows is the adjusting of the heart. And our hearts will keep being adjusted in the formation as, as Christ is formed in us. And that happens with the, all the graces that is contained in the ministry of the word, in the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the, of the songs, the singers, Hakuna Mwingine, Fana Nisha Nawewe. Those are songs with context. You can hear those who composed some of those songs. They were not in a hurry. They were waiting on the Spirit. Even now, we are going to hear many, many songs reverberating with the, the heart of the Father uh, that are composed in quiet places, in the secluded places, as, as singers and musicians search, search the heart of the Father by the help of the Holy Spirit. So we, we need all these tools uh, and equipping in our midst. And I believe that's why this uh, we, uh, women's gathering, which includes men, uh, has been called. Uh, it's not just about the many meetings, it's also about the quality of the, of the meetings, which is, uh, takes a lot of preparation and energy and sacrifice. There are people who are doing it behind the scenes, and we thank God for that. Uh, my, my contribution to the subject or topic of the, or the theme of the new wine is uh, in the context of uh, not much doctrine because we have had been taught about doctrine. We, we are not going to leave doctrine. Doctrine will continue to help adjust our hearts and all that. But there will also be practicalities. Uh, in fact, this morning when James was talking about the caller, the collar, they, they used to call it the upside down collar. The, 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 the dog collar. 
call it the dog collar. If you, if you say that in some meetings, you will be stoned. And, uh, you know, it, it was like James was seeing into my box because I have two. I have two of those. <laughs> I have two. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to throw them away <laughs> as a sign of my repentance from this meeting. And uh, the, second one, uh, the second one was forced on me. I was forced to put it. Because the meeting where we went, they said they had already made the, they had already made the whatever, the collar and the dress. And we, were, we were told that for this ceremony to go the way it's supposed to go, you must put, <laughs> you must put it. And then we were told to go home with it. So I have two. And uh, <laughs> going, to, going to throw it away. It's part of my response to that message. Conviction. <laughs> you know, James was very uncomfortable when he was mentioning that. It's because of the way we think. Our minds are still, uh, we've really been uh, bomb bombarded with so much. And some of us, some of us, we see it every Sunday because your minister uses it every Sunday. So that's why most of us are very quiet. <laughs> so we think we are judging men. We are not judging people. But we are dealing with the mentalities. Yeah. We love people. God loves people. Yeah. But uh, he loved Israel to the point of sending them Christ, Jesus, his son. And also, a son was given to us. A son has been given, not only to the Jews, but also to us. But uh, those Jews who are ministering, the pastors of the days of Jesus, the priests, and all those who are ministering, the Levites, they all were in uniform. They all had these guns. They all had these things. And they, they, it still came from the same God. It came from Moses. It says, God told him, you give them, you dress these men like this to give them dignity, yeah. give them honor. But the issue was not the dressing. The issue was the honor and the dignity behind it. And you know, we live in two worlds, both the spiritual and the, uh, and the earthly. And uh, it's a very complex thing. So, I followed, by the way, James, I followed that in the history of Kenya, why uh, especially the Pentecostal movement went back to the, to the collar and the gowns and all that. And I was told in one of the days when the first president of this country was the president, I mean, the, some of us don't know Jomo Kenyatta, the father of Uhuru. Uh, he died in 1979 or 75? 78. Some of, some of us were not born that time. The, the, some ministers, some Pentecostal ministers, preachers, especially from Nairobi, wanted to visit the president. When they went there, the, the AP, the, the one who was supposed to take them in, uh, they killed them personal assistant, PAs, personal assistants and those who are very close. When the message reached to the last PA, he said, who are these? They are uh, ministers of the gospel. So he went to see them. And they, of course, they were wearing the suits and, and all that. He said, if, if they are ministers, if they are ministers of the gospel, they cannot see the president like that. Let them go. Let them have manners of ministers. Let them go and put a collar and a, and a, and a, and a, as a sign that they are ministers. That's how it started with the Pentecost. But I'm not saying that justifies the thing. I'm just giving you a history, a small history, of the background of why the, some of the Pentecostal ministers went. Because the same Pentecostal preachers preached against that. They preached against the, the attire that uh, represents a certain posture, religious posture, which basically came from Roman, Romanism. And, uh, and, uh, and the priests, and the priesthoods of... Uh, of Rome in those days, and uh, interfered or came back to the church. Uh, Jesus did not give us that example. He's our ultimate pattern. He didn't have that. He, he spoke very hard about the religious uh, dresses of those days, the religious code of the day, both from within and without, in Matthew 23. And, uh, uh, and we know today, in the, given that history, and uh, we, we can't use that history to justify the thing. I'm just saying that's how some of the older, older preachers in our country, when we ask them, why did you start doing this? And yet you preached so much against 
and they said that's one of the experiences. That the, the office of the president could not receive ministers if they didn't have a sign, a symbolic sign that they are ministers. But you can see this, those are natural people, they are natural men, they were not spiritual people, so they asked something physical uh, to, repeat, to show that uh, those are the ministers of the gospel, but really it wasn't the case. Nowadays I don't think that's a problem, you can go and see the president without a uh, collar, without uh, all that, so long as you are a minister, you are a minister. But uh, uh, that's not the issue, so it's not even a debate, it's just a matter of conviction if you for most of us who are in the ministry some of us are have not some of us don't relate to that you even you are even wondering why we are talking about it uh, but it affects you because immediately you see somebody with a collar you think you think that's a, a a minister of the gospel the one who doesn't have and the one who have it's you for you to judge what makes the ministers it's more of what is in them and the call of god on their lives than the the uniform and the, and the outside and the externals. Uh, I was in another meeting and I said, if anyone wants to know I'm a minister by the way I dress or by the way I put whatever I call it, then that's, that's a blind man. And you, you can give the blind what they want because they cannot see in the spirit. So they can only interpret things in the physical. But that's, that's not for today. It was just a, a word in passing. The, I believe the next outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which has to do with the new wine, is, uh, is upon us. That time is upon us. We're just beginning to see the signs of the next outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, what is, uh, my topic is based on a question. What is the greatest blessing of the New Testament? The greatest blessing of the New Testament. What is the greatest? Uh, what is the greatest blessings in the New Testament? We, in, the, in, the, in the dispensation of the New Covenant. What is the greatest blessing? So some of the scriptures I'll be sharing will be based on answering that question. Another question I want to ask in the same context is: If you are asked. If you were asked by God to ask anything you want, what would you ask for? If God came to you, like he came to Solomon, and asked him, ask anything you want, and it shall be given to you. So right from the beginning, let me define the word blessing, because we have many definitions, or we have what we think a blessing is. Uh, especially in the church today. So what is a blessing? The, the apostolic reformation, the apostolic season is redefining many things. Redefining many things. One of them is the word blessing or the understanding of what is a blessing. What is to be blessed when somebody says, I'm blessed? Uh, most of it really carries a lot of uh, individual possessive uh, me, 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 and I thing. Every time most people say I'm blessed, uh, which is okay, it's good to say you are blessed, but in most cases it's, 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 uh, it's, it comes from a, just a selfish, narrow way of looking at things. And that's why some of our songs in the past move was about going to the church to get a blessing, uh, going to the church to get something going to hear the preacher so that you can go home with something. That's how songs like Kuna Kitu Leo Nyumbani Mwababa began. You remember Kitu? There is something today in the house of the Lord. There is something. Yes, there is something, but what is it? <laughs> you have to define what is that something. So you can see most people when they sing that songs, when they, that song, for example, you're just coming for a meeting to get something. That's selfish, isn't it? It's selfish, it looks selfish, sounds selfish. Just want like something and I can go home. And it meant blessing, by the way. It meant that kakitu meant blessing. That ka thing or that something meant I just want God to bless me with something and I go away. So what is, uh, 
What is blessing? With, a, with an apostolic prophetic definition. The, uh, to be blessed actually means to be empowered. To be empowered to fulfill divine purpose. That's what blessing means. Blessing means to be empowered. Or to be clothed, or to be tooled, or to be resourced to fulfill divine purpose. Each one of us has a divine purpose. The Lord has put you in the earth for a purpose. You are not here for nothing. You are here to fulfill purpose, fulfill destiny, fulfill Christ's desire, the Father's desire over us. So when you are blessed, it actually means you have been given all you need to fulfill divine purpose. That's what being blessed means. So blessing is not an end in itself. It's actually a means to. A means to. Uh, definition number two. Definition number two. To be blessed is to be endued with spiritual, to be endued with spiritual, mental, and material ability and supply in order to do God's will and to manage your environment adequately. All that is important. I repeat again, it's to be endued with spiritual, mental, and material ability and supply in order to do God's will and to manage your environment adequately. I like that. In order to manage your environment. If you, if you say you are blessed, but you, whatever your environment is, your home, your, work, your workplace, your whatever is in chaos, is it disorderly, doesn't change, does not improve, does not attract people to God, then there's a problem with what you call blessing. You don't understand what blessing is. If blessing, in, you, in, in the way you see it, does not help you to manage your environment. And each one of us has an environment. Each one of us has space, as we have heard in the past. Every, each one of us has been given space. So when you are blessed, it means you understand that uh, what you have been given in the context of blessing, in the context of the, the Heavenly Father putting you in a certain space, and then he gives you the tools to manage that space. That's blessing. So that's, that's a very, to me, that's a, a satisfying definition coming from words I have heard people speak and, uh, and uh, the apostolic graces in our midst. So I go back to the question, what is the greatest blessing in the New Testament. So let me take you back to Solomon, the question that God asked Solomon. In 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 7. On that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask, what shall I give you? That's one of the toughest questions you'll ever read in the Bible. It looks very simple. But it becomes hard when you think of how will you answer. Yeah. Yes, it looks simple when uh, the question is ask. Because even Jesus says, ask if you uh, we, we ask and it shall be. And you know, we, when, we come to the new, when we come to what Jesus is saying, sometimes we simplify that. But you see, this is, this is Solomon now. God has appeared to him after he has given a thousand, uh, a thousand sacrifices. Yes, a thousand cattle. A thousand animals are sacrificed. And that, the sacrifice itself moved God so much until God appeared to him the same night. He said, ask. If you can do all this sacrifice with my name, then I ask what you want. That's not an easy question. And Solomon asked, let's go to verse 11. Let's see what Solomon asked. Then God said to Solomon, because this was in your heart and you have not ask riches or wealth or honor. Look at that. Eh? Or the life of your enemies. Nor have you asked long life. Some of us ask all those things. All of us are in, that, <laughs> in those brackets. Eh? But have asked what? Wisdom and knowledge for yourself. 
that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom. Yes? You get that? Yeah. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. Now, this is not no more ordinary knowledge, wisdom. And I will give you what? Uh, the additions. I will give you riches and wealth and honor, such as one of the things, one of the kings have, have had who were before you, nor shall any after you have, uh, after you have the like. Okay, this is King James. Eh? Isn't, isn't that good asking? You ask, you ask something, and then God says, even the things you didn't ask, I will give you. Yeah. Is that a good asking? Yes. yes, that's what we want to do in this meeting. Yes. This thing of new wine, my friend, if we know how to ask the right questions and answer and ask, if we, if we want God to answer us in certain things that we have come to see of him and ask the right thing, we will receive even what we have not asked for. So Solomon asks for wisdom and knowledge. And then God says, because you have not, he, no, God knows what men like. Eh? Because you have not asked riches and wealth. Yes. And honor. And the life of your enemies, you know, victories. And we all want victories. And you have not even asked for a long life. You don't want to be 120, 100 and whatever. But when you ask for the right thing, all those things will be added. And they, we find that the resemblance of that in the New Testament. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Then these things shall be <laughs> added unto you. If we, if we know how to ask the right thing. So the question still remains, what is the greatest blessing in the New Testament? Now, in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, uh, Solomon asked for wisdom and knowledge. So what would be our asking in the New Testament? What would be our greatest asking in the New Testament? Can somebody try to answer that? What would be our greatest asking in the New Testament? If the Old Testament is wisdom and knowledge, what about the New? The? Can you say louder? Yes. Holy Spirit. Why do you think so? We must qualify that. You are right, by the way. The greatest blessings of the greatest blessing of the New Testament is the Holy Spirit, and I know there are many other things we we can add to that. In fact, I was trying to see if what, what comes first is it the Word or the Holy Spirit? Is it the Holy Spirit or the Word? What comes first? We look at that. In fact, the next coming, the next outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is coming to us, will come in the shape of a shadow will come in the shape of a shadow. If we know how to ask well of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come to us as a shadow. I know we're already, we already thinking about speaking in tongues. But do you know speaking in tongues is a manifestation of the presence of the Spirit? So let's not just focus on the external fast of the manifestation of the Spirit, Let's first see the Holy Spirit for who he is. He is God. He is actually involved in creation. And let's look at uh, some verses to qualify that. The Bible says in Psalms 91 verse 1. Psalms 91 verse 1. He who dwells in the sacred place of the Most High shall abide under the what? The shadow of the Almighty. That shadow there is the Holy Spirit. If you don't believe that, let's go to Luke. Luke, chapter 1, verse 35. Yes, yes. The, the Holy Spirit will do what? Oh, ready, your mama, or Mashika. Chapter 1, verse 35. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Can we repeat that loudly? The will overshadow you, and the Holy Spirit will do what? will overshadow you. So the Holy Spirit is coming now in this dimension of the apostolic. He will come as a shadow. And this is very heavy on my heart. This is very heavy on my heart. Therefore also, that, that Holy One who is to be born will be called what? The Son of God. If the Holy Spirit does not come to us as, as a shadow, as a covering, as a garment, as a mantle, then we will produce nothing. 
every outpouring of the Holy Spirit that God gives that is meaningful and that is going to be productive must come to us as a shadow. Come as a shadow. When we go to Genesis chapter 1, let's look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit, I wanted to follow that, eh? and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So actually the spirit came before the word. Yeah. Why? Because it is after this, you go to verse 2, it says, and then God said, but before God said, the spirit was already doing what? Yeah. Was hovering. So the spirit comes first. Of course, both are eternal. The spirit and the word are eternal. In the beginning was the word. But before that beginning, there was the spirit. So when the spirit comes to us, in the context of what God wants to do now in the church, he will come to us as the first, the first in the rank in ordering God's things because there is disorder in the church. And when God, the earth was without what? Form. The Bible says we are earthen vessels. God is coming back to the church by his Holy Spirit, but he is finding the church, his earthen vessel is in disorder. So for order to come in, the Holy Spirit will begin right from there. The earth had no form, the church has no form, so the Holy Spirit comes. Then the word follows. Hallelujah. So we really need to come to this uh, experience, and I'm not uh, establishing doctrine on that because it has been shared a lot to us, uh, things about the deep. If you, if, you, if you talk about the deep and all that, that reveals to us the face of the Father or the, the picture of the Father and all that, you go to the New Testament, you also see something to do with the depth. Let me share some more on this, because I'm, so, I'm very excited about this. Because I think the next wave, the next, the next outpouring of the Holy Spirit will be so heavy. It will be so heavy. My friend, it will be so heavy. I started feeling that when I was seated there, as James was sharing. Yeah, 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 I was saying, kind of, these, these things should come quickly. This, this next next phase of the workings of the Spirit. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit has not been working, but he's, he's, he's giving us another gear. Yes. He's, a, he's taking us to another level. Yes. And he will come with a certain weight. Yes. Sometimes we'll be in meetings, nobody is talking. Yes. And whoever speaks will speak with such authority. It will bring earthquakes in the kingdoms of hell. We will bring earthquakes in the church. Yes. We'll bring tremors yes. in some of the apostolic movement because some apostolic movement have been stuck. They need a tremor. They need a spiritual tremor. And some need an earthquake. Some of our churches cannot turn to God unless there is a spiritual earthquake. Yeah. And there are many ways God brings earthquakes. Let's look at the promise. Galatians 3.13. Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. I'm still trying to establish the fact that the Holy Spirit is the greatest blessings you can ever ask in the New Testament. We, we have asked for so many things, and we have forgotten this. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham, listen to this, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. Yes. Which is that blessing? That we might Receive the promise of who? Of the Holy Spirit. We know the promise that God gave to Abraham has not, in Genesis, there is not written the Holy Spirit. So Paul must have gotten a direct revelation. That actually all of that God promised. The seven things, the 14 things God promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, all of that meant the Holy Spirit. All that, you, if all those promises are not backed by the Holy Spirit, you have emptiness. Yeah. You have nothing. So the Holy Spirit is the one who carries all of this. Of course, Jesus was the vehicle, the physical vehicle, because the Spirit is a spirit. Jesus carried this in the physical. But he carried it in how? By him being filled with the Holy Spirit. Being overshadowed by the Holy Spirit during his baptism. Even his birth began by the working of the Holy Spirit. The word we have received, which is good doctrine, will not be activated without an internal working of the Spirit, an external working of the Spirit. 
And most of us, we, 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 we've really labored on the issues of doctrine for many years. Fathers have come here, they have labored on doctrine, isn't it? But how are we going to fly with the doctrine? We are going to fly when we are given wings by the Holy Spirit. And that's, the, that's the issue. That I, I want to start up that in this meeting. All of us, isn't it? And even as other preachers will be sharing on that. So, the Holy Spirit will overshadow us. And he who dwells in the sacred place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow. Don't forget that. Have that in mind. How is this shadow going to come on us? And I got this the other day. That this shadow, this next outpouring of the Holy Spirit, will come as a shadow, as a covering, as a mantle, as a clothing. You remember Jesus said, remain in Jerusalem until you are clothed. Cloth. Cloth has something to do with covering, isn't it? Cloth has a shadow. You know, if the clothing has to do with a shadow. You remember Peter? As he was walking, his shadow did what? He healed people. That shadow is the working of the Holy Spirit that was on his life. But this will come to us in the context, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this new wine that is coming, and we have already begun to sense the signals of it will come in the context of family. Will come in the context of family. That's another, that's another dimension. I know in the past we were telling everybody, receive! Now, this overshadowing will begin in the context of family. Small units of people. Small units of families, in our closets, in our families at home, in our spiritual families, even the, the larger church, the Holy Spirit will begin to come from the small home groups that we have, house fellowship. That's why the Holy Spirit will begin to, to hoover over the church. So, so fellowship leaders, you know, whatever you call them, monthly fellowship leaders, be very keen on this, because this, this hoovering, this shadow will begin to come on the level of family. So let's, let's, let's see this from, the, from uh, the life of Joseph. Matthew 1.18. Matthew 1.18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. Do you want to hear about the birth of Jesus Christ? Yes. It's as follows. <laughs> it's as follows. Hear it now as if you have never heard it. Eh? Eh? You have never heard it. <laughs> After this... Me, ma, after, after his mother, Mary was betrothed to Joseph. When you begin to talk of a mother being betrothed, being, that's family language. Yeah. That's family language. Before they came together, she was found with the what? With the child of who? Aha. A child of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> then Joseph, her husband. When you talk of a husband, that's her wife. When Joseph has been a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of who? I wanted to repeat to you that is of who? <laughs> Okay, so husband, wife, Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, he also overshadowed Joseph. And when he overshadowed Joseph and overshadowed Mary, a seed was born. Jesus, the son, was conceived in their womb, in their womb together. And she will bring forth a son. That's how you are going to bring a son. You know, the word has gone, but the Holy Spirit is already working. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. We must begin to desire this for our family. And, uh, uh, and it's going to begin. Uh, it's going to begin. God will begin to overshadow our families with the Holy Spirit. That's the next wave. That's the next outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's going to come in this manner. I'm, I'm not saying this is the only way the Holy Spirit will come. But uh, most of the evidence of the scripture shows this is the way it's going to come. Let's go to, let's go to Acts 2. That's, uh, now read with that understanding. Read with that background. Family, husband, wife, child, Jesus, children, 
family overshadowing the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come in the context of family. Now, when they had this, verse 37, Acts 2, 37. Now, when they had this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of who? Of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is, now listen to this, for the promise is to you and your children and to all who are afar off, uh, even as many as the Lord will call. The promise is for you and your children. Is that family? Yes. That's family. If you read Acts chapter 2 from verse 1 where they were told to wait, the Holy Spirit, we are aware in the, in the past uh, uh, doctrine of the Holy Spirit that actually that word, you shall receive power, is the word dunamis, and is a, is a, is from that word we get the word, uh, uh, word dynasty. You remember dynasty? And that's a family, it's a kingly family. So that's the next wave, the next wave, the next outpouring of the Holy Spirit will come to us as a shadow in the context of family. We will begin to pray as a family. We begin to ask for the leadership, for the uh, control of the Holy Spirit, for the uh, working of the Holy Spirit in our midst, for the move of the Holy Spirit in our midst. As, as father, as father, as a mother with your children. And this shadow will begin to come. We will begin to affect our lives in the next level of the, of the, coming, of the coming outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Luke eleven thirteen. Luke eleven thirteen. If you then being evil, Luke eleven thirteen. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? There is an asking there, isn't it? Yes. And is asking about the is asking the Father for the Holy Spirit. But what is the context? What is the context? You who are fathers, natural fathers, evil fathers, you know how to give good gifts to your what? To your children. How much more with the heavenly father? Why is he bringing children? Because the Holy Spirit is coming in the context of family. And we lost that in the Pentecost. We lost that in the Pentecost. So the greatest blessing of the New Testament is the gift of the Holy Spirit. I repeat again. The greatest gift in the New Testament, in the new covenant that we have come into, is the gift of the Holy Spirit. If we ask right, all the other things will follow us. And that's why we need to be very keen on how from today we relate we know, we understand who the Holy Spirit is. Remember, he is God. The, the past teachings has, have made the Holy Spirit look like he is, the third person means he is very far. It's as if he's not equal to the Son and the Father. Yet they are. He is God. We find him in creation. We find him throughout history. A prophet like Isaiah talks a lot about the Holy Spirit. Joel, chapter 2, he talks, he's the one who gives the promise about your sons will, 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 will prophesy. I mean, your sons will, see, your sons will do what? all that that we read in Acts. Your, your fathers will, old men will dream dreams, and your sons and daughters will see visions. Is that okay? Just for those who, who want to refer to that. Why is the Holy Spirit give, being given? Why is, why is the Holy Spirit going to be given? Or why do we need to ask for the Holy Spirit? He's already in us in terms of you cannot be born again without the working of the Spirit. So we are not saying that uh, the, uh, basically that if you are a, a born again Christian, you don't have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit in the context of your spirit could not be born again without the working of the Spirit. The Spirit of God who came into your life when you believed and confessed Christ and he gave you birth. You, he baptized you into the body of Christ. So there is already a measure of the working of the Spirit in all of us who are born again. Whether you speak in tongues or not, whether you believe you have uh, power to cast devils or not, 
whether you think you can preach or not, that's not the issue. You already have the indwelling Holy Spirit in, in you. So all of us are at that point. But there is more to that in the context of fulfilling purpose and destiny. You cannot do that without an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, without an overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit coming to us again on a different level. And this is what Jesus said to his disciples, wait in Jerusalem until that clothing of the land. From that day, the Holy Spirit has been poured out. He's being poured out in many, in history, the history of the church. The Holy Spirit uh, continued to be poured out in different people, on different people, in different churches, in different ways. We have seen that. There were times the church went very low, and in most of those cases, it's when the Holy Spirit was taken for granted. There was no uh, capacity or wineskin to, the, to, to, to be entrusted with the Holy Spirit the way God wanted. And all that is known for those who are students of church history. So I, as I conclude this, this session, I just wanted to give you an appetite of how much we need more of the Holy Spirit. How much our prayers need to change completely. How much in every day we just ask for the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So why do we need more of the Holy Spirit? We need him more for the, for the following reasons. We need the Holy Spirit for leadership and guidance. We need the Holy Spirit for knowledge and wisdom. You remember those things Solomon asked? If we have the Holy Spirit, we have knowledge and wisdom. Do we? Can you answer me? Yes. If we have the Holy Spirit, we have wisdom and knowledge, isn't it? Yes. We have leadership, we have guidance. Then there, will, there is something I'm calling creativity and I know innovation. There will be create, create. We need the Holy Spirit for creativity and innovation. Or innovation. We need the Holy Spirit for true productivity. If we produce anything outside of the Holy Spirit, it will be rejected. But the Holy Spirit makes us productive. So every true productivity, every true spiritual productivity in our lives, even if it means doing physical things, but are initiated by the Holy Spirit, they, that is what will be accepted before the Father. The Father will only accept that which is produced via the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, by the backup of the Holy Spirit. That's very important, productivity. Jesus talked about that. you being been called to bear what? Much fruit, productivity. If we are going to see productivity in every area of our lives, then we must go back to the Holy Spirit. So why do we need all that? I'll give you, I'll give you some scriptures and read a few of them because there are many things we can say. In fact, the Holy Spirit, the next outpouring of the Holy Spirit will be more than just speaking in tongues because the Bible says we will be able even to speak in other languages, not just tongues, other languages. And what does that mean? We'll be able to speak languages that other men understand. And that means God is going to put us in places where we release God's wisdom and knowledge to, uh, to people until they wonder, where do you come from? Who is giving you all that wisdom? Because it's not enough just to get a certificate or a degree. But we are, we are going to see people, our children who have degrees, doing better than all the others. Why? Because they are backed by the Holy Spirit. That's the speaking the language of the nations. That's what speaking to other, in other tongues means. How will you speak in other tongues to other people? For Arabs to understand Arabic. That's not the issue. It's for God, put, God will put some of us in those nations, in different peoples. And by the way you do things, the way you analyze things, the way you, you cut through issues, will cause them to ask you questions. Because the Holy Spirit is backing you up. That's speaking in other, in other languages. And that's why that adjustment of the heart that James is talking and others is very important. Because this move, this overshadowing will produce so much. It will produce so much wealth. It will produce so much authority. It will produce so much power and influence. So our hearts must be right. I tell you the truth. This thing. Because immediately the Holy Spirit begins to work. Businesses will begin to explode. Associations will begin to come up. In fact, the, the word I'm getting for most of us here who are doing business is this. Begin to look for spirit sent partners for what you are doing. Don't just do business alone. And I know some of you have gone ahead. I know some of you have been coming together and you've been discouraged. I've tried uh, in our circle of minutes to try to get men to save money. It's, it's been so hard. 
For the last, for the last two years, we tried to get a few men to, con to save 10,000 per month. We were not able to. I think two people, three or four, gave a little money here and a little money there. Two years down the line, the brother who was keeping the money for us told, told me, because the things told. So I was telling him, okay, return the money for those who had given, so that we see what next. And there were just a few, about 10 people. Jane, Jane was part of it, all of us as a family. He told me, if we were consistent in giving 10,000 a month from two years ago, we would have now raised about 800,000. 800,000, that's very close to a million. And you know a million, you can buy some good land. This is a maguta maguta, ya juja. You can a plot already. Let me tell you, let me tell you, this overshadowing that is coming, it is, it is coming on a family dimension. It's coming in the context of family. So if you begin to get the right partners in what you are doing, that's what the Holy Spirit will bless. I'm not saying there will be no individual endeavors, but now we are going corporate. We are going association. We are going circles. Sako. Those who have Sako, eh? you understand Sako? <laughs> One of the, the current CEO of Cooperative Bank is a, is a friend. We were dealing with some issues the other day. He's a big man. He's a born again brother. And we have opportunities. To get another circle to work with CEO is to kun your chai. To mumbie in your what work kingdom. To not take explode. So whether you have a circle, you have anything that is bringing people together, partners of two. You know you can be husband and a wife partnering over something. You can be two families. You can be three families. You can be four families. That's where that's where the Holy Spirit will begin to hover. But individual projects will not work, even though they look good. But when you begin to partner, there is an, a shadow that will locate you. And that's where we are going. Ah, this one, I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah. If two shall agree as touching anything, it shall be done by our Father in heaven. So most of us who are moving in that direction, you are in the right thing. Begin to call the Holy Spirit to overshadow that project, to overshadow that business, to overshadow even ministries. The day we came together with the James, to kaonge mambo yetu for one day, the whole day, kutoka subui, baka jioni, kusafishana. When we came together, our ministries began to be began to explode. We began to see fruit. Two people. What about three? What about four? What about five ministers coming together? You know, some of us are close in your own individualistic, minute, small things, and you think you are going to scare God with those things. The ones who will move and scare God yeah. are those who are going to begin to come together. Yeah. And that was the principle of Babel. Yeah. Do you know how Babel was being built? Yeah. Whom, who, what, what did the heavenly council say about Babel? They are one language. They are one, language. Yeah. They are one mind. Yeah. Nothing shall be. Yeah. Stop. God understands the principles. He came down to confuse the barbarians. <laughs> he came down to confuse them. So the people who will make God stand up on his seat and say that thing. Watch. What's that thing? Ah, those who begin to come together for the right purpose. So if we can come together for the right purpose, our Heavenly Father is ready to put a signature and a tick on what brings us together. Not selfishness, not individualism, not the selfish things we have seen in the church. God is bringing that to an end. Hallelujah. Amen. Thinking good of the other person. Thinking that, why, why don't we, can't we prosper together? Instead of just me prospering on my own, to become like, you know, that's what killed the Pentecost authority and strength. When bishops, pastors, preachers begin to, began to compete, began to show one another how much they have. You know, I wanted to read scripture, so let me try. I wanted to read scriptures. Why is the Holy Spirit coming? Because of, we need his leadership. We need his guidance, isn't it? We need his knowledge. We need his wisdom. We need creativity, innovation, productivity. And here are the scriptures that talk about some of those things. Proverbs 25, 2. Proverbs 25, verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. But the honor of kings is to search out a matter. How are we going to search out a matter? We're going to ask the Holy Spirit. This outpouring is coming in this manner. The heaven for height and the earth for depth 
And the heart of kings is unsearchable. Even us who, who are kings, the Bible says we are kings and priests, isn't it? People will try to find out where we are getting this thing, they will not get it. But as we know where we are getting it from. We have partnered, we have come together, we've been joined to the Holy Spirit. We have asked the Holy Spirit to come to help us because we are not doing anything selfish anymore. Our hearts are being adjusted. We don't want self-glory. Our influence will not be used for negative things because we'll have very high, you know, our influence will, will go very high, but we'll not use our influence for negative things. We'll use our influence for positive things. That's what good leadership is because leadership is influence, isn't it? And most of us are going to have influence. They're going to have high influence. There are people, when you go to a town, they hear you are coming, they'll gather there. They say, we have heard about you. That's influence. But we will not drive them the other way around. We will not bring them to worship us. We will point them to the God who has brought us where we are. We will show them how we have uh, been joined to the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to avoid to use the word partner. We are partnering with the Holy Spirit because that's selfish. We have been joined to the Holy Spirit. We are a one with the Spirit of God. Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. These are common verses. You know them. Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. The sacred things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us. And to who? And to who? That's generational, isn't it? The Holy Spirit is generational. Forever. For how long? For how long? For how long? That we may do all the words of this law. Jeremiah 33, verse 2. We know that. That says the Lord God who made it, the Lord who formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. That's it. That's the spirit of innovation, isn't it? That's the spirit of creativity. That's the spirit of productivity. We want this for us and our children. We are not going to stagnate anymore. Our business will not stagnate anymore. Yes. Our ministries will not stagnate anymore. Yes. In fact, kings will come looking for us. Yes. We'll not go looking for them. Yes. Why? Because of the activation of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Let's begin to prepare for the shadow. Yes. And God gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That grace is the Holy Spirit. Yes. Powerful verses like this one. Isaiah 45 verse 1, they'll come to reality. Isaiah 45 verse 1, some of you know about Cyrus, the anointing on Cyrus. This is, a, this is, this is not even a, this is not an Israelite, he's not a covenant king, he's, he's nothing, he's nowhere in the family of God. But because God's purposes have to be fulfilled, God can even anoint a heathen. Can you imagine? That's very bad. This is our oil. This is our oil with another king. This is our oil. In mafuta nani? Imeenda kwa nani? Sahi kona nani? Yay! No, 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 no. This is our oil. That says the Lord to His anointed. <laughs> That's the oil. Mafuta imeenda bana. To, to Obama, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held. Who is the son of His right hand? Isn't it us, the son of the right hand? That's the language of Benjamin. To subdue nations before him and lose the armor of kings. This is the warfare language. To open before him the double doors so, so that the gates will not be shut. None of our gates shall be shut. And that's where our sons will be ruling. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. And I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I'll give you the treasures of darkness. Ah, you think you have done anything? We have not seen anything. And hidden riches of secret places. Who searches the secret things of God? Who searches the deep things of God? The king who has the spirit. The spirit searches all things. Even the very deep things of God. Ah, that's where we are. I'll give you hidden riches of secret places. Some of you think you are rich. Because you have just counted a million the other day. They are bado, bado, bado. Prepare your muscles. Great. Get your heart adjusted quickly. Millions are coming. That you may know that I, the Lord, 
who call you by your name. I'm the Lord God of Israel. That's not prosperity teaching. This is something else. This is responsibility. Wealth, I'm going to show you next time. The five things we need to do with wealth when God gives us wealth. What five things we need to do. Okay, Simon Isha comes. 48, verse 16. Isaiah 48, 16. Come near to me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And the Lord, and now the Lord God and his spirit has sent me. So what is he saying? Verse 17. When the spirits are new, what will happen? That says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I'm the Lord your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. So we are qualifying all those things we said. He will lead us. He will guide us. He will take us ways. You know, and this profit making is not just a selfish Kenyan type profit making. It is leading us in ways that will, will bring productivity. That productive ways will be given to us. We will not invest in places that will dry up in the name of Jesus. We have done that in the past. We have learned the, we have learned the lessons. Productivity. Let's read the last verse there. Hebrews 6, 7. Hebrews 6, verse 7. When the Holy Spirit begins to hover on us, when this outpouring of the Spirit begins to come on us, it will be so different. For the earth which drinks in the rain, it will be like this. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it, and the bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessings from God. Receives blessing from God. This is in the context of doctrine and the spirit. In fact, if you read the context, you'll find that uh, 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 whoever wrote, I believe Paul wrote this book, he's talking about we who have received of the spirit. We who have received of heavenly things. In the back, if you read the context. Verse 8. But if it bears stones and briars, it is rejected and near to being cast, whose end is to be burnt. So every blessing is tied to divine promises and divine purpose. Let me conclude by saying that for this sin. Every blessing is tied to divine promises and divine purpose. If we see that, then the Holy Spirit comes to us. He begins to help us fulfill those things. He begins to help us come into the promises of God. If prophetic words have been released over your life, in the past, they'll be reactivated again. I have been in meetings where people say, well, you spoke over my life in these things that I've even forgotten, but already they are seeing those words coming out. And most of us have experienced that. Why? Because when the Holy Spirit comes, he reminds you the promise. He reminds you the word. And this is not the prosperity message you have heard. This is, this is going to be great productivity ignited by the Holy Spirit. And in the context of that, we have matured and are being matured through doctrine and our hearts are being adjusted and our resources and what the Holy Spirit produces out of us will not be wasted, will not be stolen, will not make us proud, will not make us live alone because these things are coming in the context of family. And when there is family, there is accountability. There is mutual accountability. There is mutual covering for one another. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We thank you. Your word is eternally established in the heavens. It will work and stir us our lives into the next season in God for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name.